Good evening and welcome to the Forum. I'm John Madison. Tonight we have two very interesting guests with two very different perspectives on South Africa. We have Khaleb Kachalia from a famous struggle family who crossed the aisle and joined the Democratic Alliance. But my first guest is Neva Machetla. Neva has a BA honors from Harvard, a doctorate in economics in Berlin. Uh, she's from an American family, but spent a lifetime in South Africa working in the presidency and the development bank. Her mother was an advisor to Kwame Nkrumah, the first leader of Ghana, and also president of the African Studies Association in the U.S. Neva is now at TIPS, the Trade and Industrial Policy st st Strategies. Um, uh, Neva, you've done a deep dive into South Africa and ec the economy. Um, uh, first of all, welcome to the forum. Thank you. And uh, um, uh, to start off on, on an exciting note, you see real options for us in um, uh, how we redevelop the South African economy. I suppose what's needed after COVID is sort of an, a, 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 just an exaggerated version of what we needed anyway. Uh, but one of the things you talk about is the exciting possibilities for an entirely different um, uh, transport system. We're, we're building uh, um, uh, ele uh, electric cars, tuk-tuks, uh, the kind of light vehicles that, that, that our people really need and which we haven't really catered to. Yes, and I think, in fact, what, what I mean, we did do a paper at TIPS, and what really came up was we really need to see the recovery in two phases, and particularly in the next year, before we get the vaccine in South Africa, you know, we need some way of getting people out of mass public transport, which is quite risky. And so things like, you know, light motorcycles and tuk-tuks, if we could get them built, we could build them locally, we have the capacity. If we could get them out on a mass scale, you know, particularly if they were e-vehicles, obviously, um, that would be really helpful in terms of helping people to avoid the infection while it's not under control. Because I do think, you know, we really need to see this in a phased system for the first year while we don't have a way of controlling COVID except physical distancing and masks, you know, some businesses need a new business model and we think transport is one of them. Afterwards, one of our core problems is as the world moves towards electric vehicles, but also towards cleaner fuels, we have a really strong auto industry. You know, it's basically a small globally competitive auto assembly industry, but it won't remain competitive if we don't keep up with those technologies, as well as obviously the climate crisis, which we need to address as well. Right. So we should be building char charging stations throughout the country and sort of really doing those kind of things. Those, those kind of infrastructure investments would pay, pay, pay for themselves, wouldn't they? Yes, and especially along the main freeways, because we are, you know, a relatively underpopulated country. So, you know, if you're going from here to Cape Town, you need to know you can charge a car at a fast charger relatively efficiently. Um, you know, when you need it. So all those petrol stations, we need to make sure there are charges there that would facilitate the shift. Looking at this from the outside, I have a sense that the government isn't ahead of the game, that it's not really driving these kind of uh, obvious future technologies and opportunities uh, adequately. Am I wrong? You know, I do think we have a very unequal society and a highly fragmented state that tends to reflect those inequalities. So it's very hard to get a common position in government. There is now a commitment to promoting e-vehicles. Um, we do have very, you know, government does have very close engagements with the major companies that produce here. And they're also interested. You can see there's been a series of, of announcements. So I think that's one where we should probably get there in the end. But I, I do think you know, the reality is in a divided society, it is much harder to come up with consistent policy. And I think we tend to underestimate how, how much of a drag that is, both on government policy and on overall growth. Yes. 
Um, <laughs> Uh, what, what, what other uh, opportunities are there? You've talked about, obviously, medical supplies. That's an obvious one. Yeah, although I do think part of the problem is everybody went into PPE and ventilators, and I have this feeling next year we'll have a huge oversupply. But I do think, look, if you talk about medical equipment, you know, there's a cluster of people who produce very, you know, world-class medical equipment around Gauteng. That's clearly an opportunity. I think there are a couple of those small high-tech niche industries that we need to come up with better systems to support. On the large scale, you know, food, the food processing value chain that is from agriculture to retail is very strong. Um, I think we should be looking at that. Like I said, we've got the auto industry, we've got capital goods, and we have chemicals. Those are the four industries and paper, sorry, where we are large and, you know, manufacturing industries where we're large and globally competitive, but we also have a bunch of very high value adding services like healthcare, education, um, all the professional business services where we're also very strong. And I think all of those are areas where we should be looking at growth. Um, you know, many people from different sides of ideological perspectives say to me that business and government are not really on the same page and they need to be more on the same page. I mean, I, just for a background, I studied, you know, the rise of Japan. Uh, uh, and so, you know, I, and, and what, what oh, the, the lesson I got from Chalmers Johnson, who was my, my, the guy I admired. Really? Him, you know, Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, was, was that at, when, it, when the Japanese government was too powerful and told business what to do, things didn't work. When business was too powerful and told government what to do, things didn't, didn't work. The big success and the big growth period of Japan was when business and government were relatively equally matched and had to work together. Uh, do you agree with that? And, and what is the way forward to get those two on the same page here? Um, yeah, I think the way forward is difficult, but I, I agree with you, it has to be done. Look, I think the biggest problem, com if you compare us to Asia, that as you say, industrial policy has worked where government and business have been able to collaborate. We have on top of that, though, a layer of a sort of post-colonial malaise, where on the one hand, you know, business and government didn't go to school together. They don't have those kinds of integral links you saw in Asia. Sure. And on the other hand, it's a very unequal society, so you can't assume that you know, when we talk about industrialization, if in a democracy that is highly unequal, there is an imbalance, you know, that the economy is very unequal. In theory, politically, we're all equal. In practice, that leads to all kinds of tensions between the people who have political power and the people and need to maintain benefits to their constituencies and growing the economy by just letting, giving business their head. And I think it's that contradiction makes it particularly difficult in South Africa to come up with a common policy because we don't, you can't assume the benefits will trickle down in ways that maintain political support. And you know, the other problem is, you know, it's 40 years later, we're latecomers, and also economies have become far more complicated. So, you know, when you look at what they did in Asia in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, it looks relatively simple to what we'd have to do to try and develop a new industry here and get into new markets. Yes, I, I certainly take your point. It's about more complicated, and the technology is more complicated. Right, and and we're late comers, and it's not so easy to just go into manufacturing the way the, consumer manufacturing the way they did. But I want to ask you one uh, more difficult question. I I think, um, and that is, did we not incentivize black ownership over black job creation? Yeah, what you left out of my CV is I worked for Kosatu for seven years from 2000 to 2007. And yes, we, that's exactly what we would have argued then. I do think that it's a very difficult issue. So really what you're saying is how much should we prioritize more representative big business over, you know, an economic transformation that supports small business and job creation also. And I think, you know, I would argue that that's a very hard thing. And part of the problem about having a fragmented government is that people can form shop and both, you know, black owned business and big white business, which actually has a lot more power, are able to go between departments to get what they want. And it makes it very hard to have a consistent policy. And I mean, the, to me, what that says is this, if government wants to engage effectively with business, and I think this is what they did well in Japan and other countries, government itself has to have, you know, when you're negotiating, you need to have a united front where you're very clear about what your priorities are, you're clear about what kind of power you're prepared to use, you're clear about what business wants, and you're clear about what their power is. Whereas we keep going back and forth, 
between sort of slamming big business and then telling them how much we love them, you know, that's not really how you make progress. Yes, I mean, that, that's, that's, that certainly uh, resonates with me. Um, what, what then is, is the, uh, I, I mean, uh, yeah, some people, yeah, what, what, what then is the, the way to get government and business on the same page? I mean, it sounds to me like you're saying, when you talk about a fragmented government, I mean, isn't that because of our politics are fragmented because of the divisions in the ANC? You know, it's also institutional. Um, if you draw a diagram of how policymaking is done in government, you've got many different parallel departments. You've got Treasury, which has control over the fiscus, but not necessarily over policy. You've got the presidency, which has theoretically some control over policy, but has limited capacity. Then you've got the different spheres of the state. Then you've got the, you know, autonomous bodies like regulators and state-owned companies and DFIs and all of those things that have quite a high degree of autonomy. It's very hard, you know, so if, for instance, Department of Trade and Industry disagrees with the refinery, they can go off to mineral resources. And if the environmental people want to put in restrictions, those companies instantly go and lobby trade and industry. Yeah? And so to me, the, this is why people have been saying forever, the presidency needs the capacity not to write policy, but to quality control policy proposals before they go public. So you don't have these sort of random proposals going out there that then got shot, get shot down by the rest of government, but also needs the capacity to truly monitor implementation. And they are moving in that direction, but I think, you know, it, it will always be difficult because in such a divided society, you know, when Japan says we want to develop manufacturing or Korea or Taiwan or China, most people can see how they will benefit from it. They're also, we're also fairly authoritarian authoritarian governments in some of those cases. But most, you know, ordinary people can see how they would benefit, so they support that process. And business itself is not as divided as here. So here, if we decide electricity should go to the down, downstream steel providers instead of um, to the, the big mines and refineries that are exporting, that right there, you end up with a conflict. Yeah? So I think, in a, you know, we are one of the most unequal societies in the world, and I don't think we can get away from the fact that that will create contestation. And I think all of us just have to, we try to manage it, but I don't think it helps to just say, can we all be friends? I think we have to be realistic that we can try and set up systems to mediate those disputes better and make sure that once you've reached a settlement, it sticks, where we've also not been great. We but what I don't think we can do is just wish it away. We need to take a break, but we'll be right back. And we're back talking to Neva Machetler, the, the economist at TIPS. Uh, Neva, just to finish our discussion about that, I mean, it does, I mean, I mean, you could, if you're cynical, say that it means the president isn't putting his foot down hard enough. Or you could say, okay, so two things. Firstly, the ANC coming out of the struggle has always been a coalition. I would argue that anybody who becomes president of it has to be good at coalition building. That that's a feature, not a bug. And, but also that the reality is in a very divided society, we need a president who can build coalitions. The people who say he's not putting his foot down, it's usually they want him to do what they want instead of something else. And he's not doing it because it's politically not viable. I think, you know, to me, the bigger issue is how can we make sure there's, you know, the, the presidency is works on a shoestring. It always has. I used to be there at PCAS. There were like six or seven of us. If you're going to have a, a structure that can actually look at quality control on policy across the state, you would need to have a stronger staff. And I think if he could get a stronger, high quality technical team that you know, should be built up over time, that that would help. But of course, then you get pushback from the departments because of course, everybody wants their own power. How far the, does the recovery plan that yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, uh, the president has brought out a recovery plan recently and we've had the mini budget. How far does that help uh, resolve these issues? You know, I think it's that that's one of those where the devil's in the detail. I do think at this point, the biggest issue we need to confront. And again, I think we need to be prepared for the downturn in the economy is going to sharpen some of the disagreements. And, you know, we just need to be clear about that. 
But you know, you can't have a recovery plan if you don't have adequate resources. The budget is declining in real terms. So unless we can find ways to mobilize resources from other areas, whether it's through sort of something equivalent to a war bond, to you know, a solidarity tax, or through tapping into social security funds, because after all, they're set, they were set up to deal with disasters and we're in a disaster. If we can't find ways to mobilize savings across the economy, then I don't think the recovery is going to be that strong. You know, what we saw in 2008, 2009 was compared to countries that really recovered rapidly, South Africa had quite a weak fiscal strategy. So, you know, to be fair to Treasury, they're going way into debt. They're accepting they can't cut spending that much. Right. But the fact is normally with the stimulus package, you want to increase spending, not just avoid cutting it. Yes. Um, but I, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, you, you're talking about the capacity of the presidency, but isn't there a problem of a capable state in the ministries as well? Yeah, I don't think, you know, yes, of course there is. But I do think that, you know, I could argue that, you know, there are definitely pockets of excellence in the state that we don't see. I would argue that the real problem is there's no way to deal with areas where there's a profound disagreement and say, this is now where we're going to go and then be cons you know, be aligned around that solution. And that's why I would come down to the presidency as being critical. Because that, what happens, if you have a debate, for instance, we were talking about BEE. If you have a debate about BEE and two departments just disagree about what it should look like, it's very hard to come up. You know, there's nobody there who says, okay, we're going to go with this view and everybody must stick to it. And until we have that, it's going to be difficult, I think, to come up with consistent policies. But isn't that exactly what a democratic government cabinet is supposed to do. But then cabinet also needs more technical support. You know, I'm using presidency kind of as code for cabinet. Okay. But cabinet has even less technical. I mean, there is virtually no independent technical support for cabinet. So you end up with people debating based on the, the cabinet memos they have in front of them with very little capacity to go and double check things. But also, you know, cabinet has limited capacity to look at proposals as they come through. And certainly virtually none to, to review proposals when they're still being formed and out there for public engagement. But so we, we I mean, what, you, what, what comes to my mind when you say that is that we have a government, uh, a civil service uh, that is drawing quite substantial sh share of the uh, public purse on salaries, and yet they don't have the capacity. How, how does one reconcile those two? Okay, firstly, just to be clear about the public service, remember that the vast majority of public servants are, like half of them are, almost half are in education. Like there's 350,000 educators, there's 150,000 nurses, there's about 100,000 police. So the bulk, you know, the, the salary issue is not really the critical issue here. The actual senior management is 10,000 and most of them are also in implementation. But no, I would argue that the problem is not to me the quality of the policy people. If you look at them, they all have, you know, if you've ever sat in on those, those um, any public sector workshop or whatever, they all have graduate degrees. I would argue they probably need more experience in mentoring and management because that's something we fell down on, but they're all highly qualified, um, the people who do policy. To me, the problem is something else, which is there is no center that says, you've come up with this good idea and somebody else has come up with another good idea. How do we firstly do the impact assessment more seriously and secondly make sure that they don't contradict each other? Because you can come up with good arguments, particularly if you're in a sector department where you're looking at your industry. I mean, to take a really obvious example, the tourism guys are pushing for more travel, domestic and international. The health guys know perfectly well that's going to spread COVID. If you don't come up with somebody who can mediate between that, okay, because it's a disaster, we've been better on that than on some other things. But the fact is, you know, you need to have somebody who can mediate between those two perspectives that reflect their sectors and say, this is what we're going to do. Whereas what we've done in some of these industries is people just forge ahead with what they want to do while the other guy, you know, and, and there's much less capacity. This is where the presidency and I agree cabinet, but first the presidency is the technical support for cabinet should be coming through and saying, this is now what we're going to do. This is how we manage the contradictions. And we've looked at the impacts and the benefits outweigh the cost, at least for our constituencies. Um, I want to move on. You, you've recently done a, a, a quite a deep dive into the mining sector and you've argued that the, that the mining still dominates our economy. 
Uh, and I wanted you to, but you don't initially take the same view as, as, as uh, other commentators about its role. Uh, my sense is mining is, is contributing less and less to job creation. Uh, we also need a just transition to renewable energies and so on. Um, how, how, how do you see that? So just to be clear, what, what you can see when you look at mining is it's a small share of the GDP, it's an even smaller share of employment, but it's a, about half of our exports. So arguably you can say in terms of how we relate to the global economy, you know, this is how we fund our imports largely, that and borrowing. Right. And it's also one of the, and what's critical there is because it's one of the industries where we have immense capacity and that makes us internationally competitive. There has been an issue around employment creation because gold and platinum are deep mines. They're labor intensive, but where we've been shifting toward is export of ferro alloys and iron ore and coal, which tend to be open pit, so they employ far fewer. So the decline in the gold mines and now in platinum means that we've been losing mining jobs. And of course, you, the commodity boom globally came to an end in 2011. And since then, mining internationally has been facing headwinds, including here. So having said all of that, I do think that, you know, we need to think about how do we, I would argue, you can't create a lot of jobs in mining. Um, it's rather, how do you use the resources for mining to invest in ways that will create jobs elsewhere? In terms of the just transition from coal, look, I think in many ways, the coal value chain is core to our economy. And we should not underestimate the impacts it will have as the world shifts away from it. We're one of the most coal intensive economies in the world by far. Um, you know, most countries, 15% of their electricity comes from coal. Here it's 85%. And then about a third of 20% of our petrol is from Sasol that is also based on coal. Um, and the energy there has been used to set up, you know, very big refineries, energy intensive refineries that would not be viable otherwise. As the price of electricity has gone up and as it's become more unreliable, that has a profound impact on our economy. So you can argue that electricity use is now 5% below where it was a year ago. At its lowest point, it was like 70% below where it was a year ago during the level five lockdown in April. But it's not coming back now, largely because of the constraints on ESCOM and the fact that people are looking to, they're either closing down energy intensive plants or they're looking to other kinds of generation. And that right there shows you how much of a constraint electricity has become on the economy. Now, um, uh, people talk about the just transition. In other words, finding a way for, uh, to, to, to recreate jobs that will be lost in coal, uh, in, in, uh, in, in renewables. And there does seem to be real potential for job creation in renewables. Uh, how do you see that just transition? And is it going to work in practice? Yeah, TIPS has done a lot on the just transition. In fact, we're having a series of seminars on it now, and we did some documentation for environmental affairs recently on it. I think the one thing I would say that I feel strongly about is for South Africa as a country, clean energy is obviously a major potential, both in terms of employment in the industry itself, but even more in terms of making our downstream industries more competitive, more viable internationally, more sustainable. Um, I do think that when we look at the jobs that people go into from areas that were dependent on coal, which are almost exclusively in Mpumalanga, and um, coal-based electricity, we need to look at the whole variety of things they can do and not just say they have to go into clean energy. So we need to be looking at all the opportunities for growth and how they can slot in there and what they need, what particularly the most vulnerable workers and communities can slot into in terms of national and global value chains um, and not just say the just transition is only about the shift from dirty electricity to clean electricity. Is Having that said that, heavily clean, clean technologies are a huge source. I mean, in many parts of the world, they generate far more jobs than coal does. Right. Um, uh, we, we just have a minute left. Um, is, there a, is there a chance that there will be a coordinated management of, the, of our just transition? Yeah, no, I think we're moving in that direction. I think there's been a lot of consultation um, I think the difficulty is to move away from sort of being warm and fuzzy to being, you know, really saying what are the tough choices, what are the hard decisions, and what we were saying before, how do you make those decisions and make them stick, partially by getting sufficient buy-in from stakeholders and coming up with innovative ideas that, that lead to win-win solutions and partially by ensuring consistency across the state.
Yeah, and I mean, one of the problems we have, which, I, you know, you, you see the impact of it in America and Britain with the rise of, of right-wing populism as a result of unequal uh, uh, results of uh, globalization and new technology. You were saying uh, when we talked earlier that the, the free state has been a major victim of the changes in, in, in e economic growth and, 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 and uh, uh, some other towns have been beneficiaries, but we have to do a better job of, uh, of, of managing that transition. I'm afraid we're out of time, but thank you, Neva Mochetla. It was great talking to you. I hope we can do it again. Lovely talking to you. We need to take a break, but we'll be right back. And we're back. Uh, my guest now is uh, Khaleb Kachalia. Uh, Khaleb is from a famous ANC family that he was forced into exile. He spent most of his early years out of the country, first in then Swaziland. Then in the United Kingdom, he studied uh, at uh, the uh, famous School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, also in Wales and at Fitz. Uh, and then he decided to join the Democratic Alliance and ran for mayor of Ekuruleni in uh, 2016. Now Khaleb is an MP and Shadow Minister of Public Enterprises. Khaleb, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, John. Good to be here. Khaleb, I have to ask you, uh, what made you turn your back on the Congress movement and join the DA? Well, John, I was, I was born, if you like, into the Congress movement. And uh, in those years, it was essentially a struggle for freedom. When freedom was delivered to us in 1994, I, like millions of other South Africans, gave rope to the incumbents who had delivered this unto us to deliver further a, a, a better life, as they said, for all. Over the years, it became increasingly apparent that that was not the case. The life was not better for the majority of people. And in tandem, and perhaps as a cause, corruption, inefficiency, and all sorts of maladministration was par for the course. When Zuma came to power, as it were, I began to have very serious misgivings and began to, to make my voice heard. When it was during that period that I began a number of discussions with, if you like, a, a, a coalition of the willing who were, who were beginning to make their voices heard again, Zuma, that various discussions ensued and one thing led to, the, to another and I felt that the DA was a suitable engine for me to to, to, to join and to ensure that I also, I also found, John, I also found in the DA um, a resonance with my, with my essential liberalism, which had developed over the years. Yes. We'll come to the politics at the end, but I want to talk to you about your portfolio. You're, uh, you're, you shadow the Minister of Public Enterprises, Pravin Gordon. Um, when he took office uh, after, uh, in this position after Pre uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa took over, uh, he was so admired. I mean, he'd been one of the few people who stood up to President Zuma. He had a great record at, as running the... Uh, SARS, the uh, South African Revenue Service, and as finance minister. How do you think he's done at public enterprises? I don't think he's done very well at all, and the, and the record will show. There have been repeated attempts, in, and he has been in charge of it, to fix what is essentially wrong. Nothing has been fixed. In fact, we've gone backwards. In every single of the seven, uh, seven state-owned enterprises under his aegis in this ministry, 
it's a it's it's a litany of disaster uh you know the story as well as everyone else in terms of the crippling debt the the euphemistically termed load shedding and the like which which bedevils escom you understand and as does everybody else i think the 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 chronic problems which are beset uh transnet which is supposed to be the economic spine of our country hardly that it's not an economic spine with it it's 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 rail infrastructure is 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 in disrepair it is it's rail infrastructure it's it's the cost of rail is is way in excess uh, in excess of of road transport and as a result we have uh, our roads being being damaged significantly by by vehicles which 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 should not be uh, uh, be using them never mind the cost the ports are the most expensive ports in the world i could go on danel is bankrupt saa is a basket case alex core is bankrupt is bankrupt sa um, sa express is bankrupt i mean this is not a this is this is a list of 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 of, of disasters not not of successes but at the same time year in year out we told that we are cleaning up we are cleaning up the maladministration. We are cleaning up the corruption. We are putting new committees in charge. We replace boards. We replace CEOs. But the bottom line doesn't change. And this must be laid inexplicably sometimes, I think, at the door of Praveen Gordon, who, as you say, had a track record in the past, in SARS particularly, of some significant success. Maybe this is too big for him maybe the challenges are too big maybe the impediments that government and his and his colleagues place in his way are too big but maybe also his predilection for state control for big government for the absence of any moves in the direction of privatization uh, and uh, must must be taken into into regard uh, i'm not necessarily a fan of privatization over public entities uh, i mean but when but when there is market failure as there patently is in these, in these public enterprises then we must then we must allow the public sector uh, to to see if it can do better sorry you you mean it the other way around when there's public failure you need to give it to the market i, I think that is is oh, that right. yeah, sorry did i did i say the other say it the other way around but it, it, it seems that, uh, yeah, I must admit, I also expected uh, speedier uh, repair under both Presidents uh, Ramaphosa and under Minister Pravin Gordon. Um, but w are there not structural problems or is, was it the, the poison pill that was, was left at NASREC by President Zuma saying, you know, tying his hands on things like uh, the South African Airways, whereas maybe... That would be, you know, that the South African Airways doesn't help the working class in South Africa. It's, it doesn't support their needs. Uh, that might have been the first one you could have done something about. Uh, but they seem to be politically, their hands are tied. Well, uh, this is a vanity project par excellence. It, it, we are, Praveen Gordon and Tito Mbaweni have, together with the blessing of, of, of the president, have pumped huge amounts of money, tens of billions of rands into this, this bankrupt entity to try and revivify it. This is not, this is the beginning of yet another floodgate that's been opened of bailouts, which have a, which have a history of failure in the past, and we're now revisiting that in the future. And the money is being taken at an extremely crucial time in a COVID and post-COVID environment from education, from health, from policing and the like. This is unforgivable and ununderstandable. But yet, Mr. Gordon and his allies in, in, in government pursue this course. It's inexplicable. I don't understand it and it needs to be called out.
What would you do uh, differently if you were in charge, if you were the Minister of Public Enterprises, what would you do? Let's start with ESCOM. Do you agree with the separation into three sections that's been going on? And, and what would you do differently? I don't disagree with the separation of ESCOM into three entities, but you must realize that the three entities, transmission, distribution, and, uh, and generation, uh, of those three entities, uh, generation counts for 85% of the business. Transmission and distribution count for 15%. The problem lies in generation. And, and the problem of generation needs to be addressed. The problem of generation lies within the, the infrastructure, the fleet of power plants which we have, which have been run into the ground, which have not been maintained, which are not environmentally compliant, and every and which have been run badly. Add to that that we don't have the expertise to run these places anymore. Add to that that we don't have the money, even if we had the expertise to do so, except for crippling debt, which currently by the own admission is something of the order of 480 billion. Actually, if you take into consideration the, the, the cost of forward maintenance and off balance sheet cost, it's something like 788 billion and rising. This is, this is untenable. ESCOM's paper in the markets is worth nothing. It is the, it is the, re, the reason why in large measure, why we have faced downgrades from the rating agencies. So as someone coming in and saying, what should we do differently is extremely clear. We have to, we have to sell off or get strategic equity partners on board in the various generation units. As I say, that, that's 85% of the business. And ensure that those are run productively and private enterprise comes to the party. Similarly, in the 15% that encompasses a distribution and, 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 and transmission, we have to open things up to the private sector. We have to allow unfettered uh, uh, access by independent power producers. We have to allow people to put their own energy and sell the surplus. Those are small areas they will not necessarily fix the entire problem. You have to fix the base load, you have to fix the generation, and you have to reduce your expense and your reliance on, on burning diesel to keep the lights on, which is extremely expensive. All this needs to be put in place and can be put in place. And when you send a message like that to the markets, the markets will respond positively, but we are doing the exact opposite. My heart goes out to Andre De Reiter at, uh, uh, at uh, ESCOM um, because his hands must be tied uh, by, the, by the dead hand of state control. Uh, it's not an easy place to operate. Caleb, we must take a break, but we'll be right back. And we're back talking to Khaleb Kachalia, the Shadow Minister of uh, Private Enterprise. Khaleb, um, so would you, would you completely remove all fetters on privatizing uh, at all three components of ESCOM? Yes, I mean, I think, I think this needs to be done and it can be done. Uh, where, where the state needs to, to have uh, 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 an equity, uh, uh, a portion of the equity that can be negotiated, but it needs to be negotiated on the terms of the investors. The investee can't call the shots. The world works not quite like that. Well, you know, this raises a subject I, I've been asking a lot of my guests because a lot of them have raised the question. We have business in South Africa and we have government and they seem to be uh, a, a daggers drawn. They're on different pages. They're not uh, to mix metaphors, they're just not uh, working together in a, in a really productive way. What is needed to get them talking to each other? Nazarek, I mean, sorry, uh, Nedlak, where they're supposed to talk, doesn't seem to have solved the problem. 
Well, you know, if 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 the cards are put on the table, the problems at ESCOM in a transparent manner are put on the table. Not in this sort of opacity we live we live under, this command and control structure, which continues to be the order of the day there, which is the kind of uh, Praveen Gordon uh, uh, way of doing things, I'm, it's, I'm sad to say. If, if, if the contracts are put on the table, if there's complete transparency about the plans as what needs to be done and the problems, then the private sector can come forward and say, in this particular area, we have expertise, we have funding, and we have, uh, and we have the will to come on board. Let us talk about the terms of our engagement and in a normal business-like environment, sit across the table and negotiate the future of the electricity industry in this country. That can be done, but it requires both sides to sit on the ta around the table. And now, as you rightly point out, the other party that needs to sit around the table, they of course. sorry, say again, no, are they not sitting around the table? Do they not meet? Do they not have these negotiations? Not even at Ned Nedlac. Well, they meet. They meet at Nedlac, but there isn't much traction there. Uh, uh, and it uh, and 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 the problem and the problem is that at, that at Nedlac they're meeting at a at a meta level, if you like, to discuss the bigger issues of the oh, day. It should be the other way around. You sit across the table and you say, what are we going to do about Madupi and Kusile, for example? What? Put that squarely on the table. And out of that laser-like focus on a huge problem, you will either find a solution to it or you will take it off the table. And then out of that solution, you will begin to address the bigger issues that Nedlac uh, attempts to deal with without much success. Now, I think if you approach it on, in that way, then you will get some traction. Um, uh, you, you also uh, um, uh, have Donnell, the, the, what used to be Arms Corps, which was started in the apartheid era as a as a business manufacturing arms and munitions. Um, should we have that at all? And are, we, are you comfortable with who we sell our arms to? Look, for better or for worse, Danell at one stage was a technology leader. Yes. And out of, and out of that particular set of technology, as you know, uh, various other spin-offs in the world of technology occur, and that is desirable and good. The, the who one sells to needs to be governed very carefully in terms of our responsibility in the world and in terms of the oversight that parliament needs to, needs to place on this. Now, and that can be done. The problem is that it has been, again, a victim of state capture, of mismanagement, of so-called transformation, which has resulted in gross inefficiencies. And the net result is, is bankruptcy. Staff, senior, experienced technical staff have left in droves to competitors. There is no money in the, in the, in, in the kitty anymore. Uh, so this is a sad state of affairs where 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 Danelle can't deliver on international nor local projects. It can't service its needs, the needs of of our local defense industry, and it is unable, it seems, to service the needs and the market outside in terms of of, of, of global defense industries. Yeah, it's another basket. Caleb, uh, we we uh, we we have a little time left. I wanted to ask you. You know, you ha you the DA has a new leader in John Steenhazen. Um, 
you were very involved in the local elections in 2016, and it was really a very different time from now. The DA was growing fast and uh, did well enough with the other opposition part parties to deliver quite a serious blow to the ANC, and of course in Chwane or Pretoria, in Johannesburg, in Nelson Mandela Bay, and, and in Kuruleni, where you were the candidate and you almost became the mayor. Um, what do you expect? Next year, we've got local government elections again. Uh, but the climate is very different. What, what do you think are the opportunities and what do you expect to happen in the local government elections next year? John, I wish I had a crystal ball. I don't. And in politics, those are very hard to come by. But <laughs> let me attempt to answer. Let me attempt to answer. The uh, uh, local elections, Never mind local elections. The DA is in a period of recalibration. As you know, we instituted a review, or the, the previous leader, Musi Maimani, instituted a review which reported, and, that, and the findings of that review are now being implemented. Uh, as a result of, of the findings of that particular review, which pointed some very, very acute fingers at things which happened in the past under the aegis of Mr. Maimani and others, things had to be set right. We are in the process of doing so. It, because of what happened in the past and because of what is happening in the period of consolidation and recalibration, if you like, I see it as a one step back to take two steps forward. This is necessary. It is it is part of what has been called by, by Tony Leon in the past, the long obedience. This is, this, there is no overnight panacea. The long obedience is necessary. If necessary, we take a step back to take two steps forward. We rebuild in a challenging time, in a time where identities, where, where minority identities are being pushed, not only in this country, but globally to the hilt. Uh, uh, and, and people are finding solace in, 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 in the politics of identity. The DA, by comparison, has said, we will push a non-racial agenda. We will stand up for what we believe to be right. We've had a policy conference where our policy has become clear for the first time in a very long while. And we are able to say who we are. Now, whether the electorate is going to, is that, whether that's going to resonate with, resonate with the electorate is anyone's guess. But as I say, it requires the long obedience. And that is what is not. And do you think that, um, uh, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but what does that say about a redress of, of, of uh, uh, the long history of, of white capital in South Africa that left black people out of the system? How do, how do you get them into the system without uh, having some kind of form of racial identity? Well, firstly, you don't do what the ANC government has done over a quarter of a century, because that has got us nowhere. So you have to approach it from another angle. You have to say that in terms of redress, we need to do the following things. But we cannot root this in race because that has proved unhelpful, destructive, and has delivered very little. So yeah. what we need Sorry, what we, we need to do, John, we need to measure. We saying let's measure disadvantage. And where disadvantage has been measured, let us understand how we can then effect certain amelioration thereof on an inclusive basis to build something going forward. Now we have grounded this in the sustainable development goals uh, that, uh, that, that, that we are working in tandem with. We are looking at, at, uh, at means testing and we are building a framework around this which is qualitatively different. And that, I think, has a chance of success significantly better than what has been delivered 
over 25 years of pretty much mismanagement. And that, that's a good note to end it on. Khaleb Kachalia, thank you so much for being on the forum. And thank you for watching. Uh, we'll see you again next week.